Welcome to the Revelation series, part 45. And we're well past the halfway mark. So thank, I want to thank everybody for, for uh, staying on board. And it gets, it gets intense for the next few chapters. And then it breaks wide open as far as uh, un unlocking what our future is. Absolutely amazing. That's exciting to get to. But as God would design the book, there's a whole bunch of stuff that he wants to tell us before he gets there. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we need you to speak to us uh, beyond our brains, what no mind can know, but you will reveal it to us by your Spirit. So Lord, we're going to try, try our best to in interpret what you're saying in these four short verses. This evening, Lord, uh, teach us to rightly divide your word. We, we love and covet your word. We just love, love your Bible. Thank you for preserving it all these thousands of years. And we're going to take advantage of it tonight and of your presence in your name. Amen. So, as far as recap, there's three major parts in Revelation. The first part is the first five chapters, sets the stage of the Revelation. The Revelation, which is not end times, it's about Jesus. So he introduces himself. He speaks to the, to the churches of the cause and effect of obedience and disobedience. Then he takes us to mission control, the throne room of heaven, verse chapters four and five. And all of this to convince us that he is in control, no matter what you read in the other two sections of this book, God is in control and he loves humanity. He, he loves people. That's really gonna come across in this teaching tonight. The next section, chapter six to 19, deals with the seven years of tribulation which is God's design before ending this age to force people into, the, <clears throat> into a decision for God or against God. <clears throat> then chapters 19 to 22 describes post-tribulation events in consecutive order. So Armageddon, which is part of the tribulation, is the ending. The second coming, which culminates the great tribulation, the second coming of Jesus. The millennial reign on earth, so a thousand more years on earth where Jesus sets up his throne here, and then the white throne judgment, all of humanity that ever existed, that ever walked this sod, and they get, they get judged, and then the current earth and heaven disappear, and then the new earth, new heaven, new Jerusalem appear, and the next story begins. So here we are in the 15th chapter, right in the middle of the Great Tribulation, but it the next few chapters focuses... And chapter 14 and 15 have focused on the last part of the tribulation. And this is why I was thinking about, I, I wanted to get this out as far as understanding the book. You have seven seals on a scroll that Jesus is, is popping each seal. And then as soon as that seventh seal is popped off and the scroll is completely un, 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 unfolded, or un unrolled, unraveled, then that seventh seal is the second coming of Jesus. So the tribulation is seal one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven. And But then it says after the seventh seal, then the seven trumpets, the seventh trumpet being the exact same imagery as the seventh seal, so the second coming, and and kind of in consecutive order, the seven bowls of wrath, which we're looking at, uh, tonight, at least the introduction of it. So the seven trumpets and the seven bulls of wrath all happen as part of the second coming of Jesus. So the second coming isn't just boom, he's here, done. It happens over months. Because remember, one of the trumpets happened over a five month span. Remember the torturing of, of, uh, of people, but that, that locust with the stinger wasn't allowed to kill it? Anyway, so so most of this chapter, the second, second uh, part, chapter 6 to 19, deals with the events of the second coming. But we're going to see God's heart in it and, and why that second coming is so intense and so belabored is because God doesn't want to have to kill anybody or destroy anybody. So it, it's very belabored. We're going to see it again tonight. All right, so here we are. Because when Jesus arrives in the second coming, he wipes out every unbeliever, Gentile unbeliever, so non-Jew unbeliever, and the opportunity to be saved 
will be over. So now let's read our text. I've split this chapter into two different teachings. So here's the first half of this chapter. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. Seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last, because with them God's wrath is complete, which is true. We fit the seventh seal, the seven trumpets we've already looked at, and the seventh plague will be the end. No more delay. <laughs> we'll get to that. Verse 2. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire. And standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name, they held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Wow. Okay, so just an overall context comment. This is the same setting as last week's teaching, the harvest of grapes. It comes out of the temple, which we're going to see next week in particular, verse 5. After this, I looked and I saw heaven, uh, in heaven, the temple. So this, the, this event, these, these people come out of the temple, which is a place of atonement. There's a presence of fire, and fire coming at, from an altar means atonement, and God's wrath is represented. So once again, this is very interesting. We see b the beloved saints being used as an encouragement for, for God, before God, so this great multitude that we're reading in chapter 15, this group of believers is there to spur God on because they've been directly affected by unbelievers. Okay, so, so I don't want to get ahead of my teaching. So verse 2, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. So this is, this is the, the great multitude. They have been directly affected by the beast and by the economy of unbelievers. The number of its name, that was the mark of the beast. You can't buy or sell without it. These people have been directly, these believers have been directly affected by it. So God's wrath is fired up. Once again, encouraged by his beloved believers. So this recurring setting is not to be missed as a loving God pours out his wrath, because that's hard for us to justify. God using the fellowship, relationship, and communication of his believers as incentive and encouragement to do what must be done for their eternal pr pr protection. He has to destroy his unbelieving, his beloved unbelieving children. So now, verse by verse. Verse 1, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. This is important to recap, because when, when the sun goes down, even tonight, and those stars appear, the whole story, God has put the whole story of creation, from creation to the very end, in the stars. Genesis 1, 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. So they're there to mark times. Daniel 6, 27, he performs signs and wonders in heaven, in the heavens and on, on the earth. Acts chapter 2, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. There are four biblical references to signs in heaven. The first that we read was Israel, Revelation 12, a great sign appeared in heaven. Remember that? A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head, which represents Jacob, Rachel, and the 12 sons. So this is Israel. Satan is represented in, uh, so two verses later, actually, in the 12th chapter. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. Then we saw the beast out of the sea, the next chapter. And this is only the illusion of a sign from heaven. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. And then, of course, our, our text tonight, the last seven plagues, the angels. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues. So the, 
the verse goes on to say, seven angels with the seven last plagues last because with them God's wrath is completed. Now, here's, here's how we can really emphasize what that this is completed. There are 19 references to the number seven in Revelation. There's the seven churches, seven spirits, sevenfold spirit, remember that? The seven golden lampstands, the seven stairs, seven lamps, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven thunders, 7,000, uh, seven heads, seven crowns, seven angels, seven plagues, seven bowls of wrath, seven mountains, and seven kings. Seven, biblically, is the perfect number, complete, the number of God. It speaks loudly that throughout the Revelation, no matter what it looks like, it's perfect, and it's God's revelation, okay? So there's constantly signs in, in here. When I, when I see them, like that number seven, it's like, nope, that's there on purpose to, 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 to just stamp that it's perfect, and, it's, and this is God's revelation. This is the last of the, of the plagues of the tribulation, second coming. Five chapters earlier, and I already alluded to this, that angel got up and, de and declared, there will be no more delay for Jesus coming back, the second coming. There'll be no more delay. Remember that? But John, go and prophesy one more time. Five chapters have gone by, but uh, it, it will eventually come to an end. Verse 2. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire. So we know that there's a sea of glass clear as crystal that's in front of the throne. We saw that in the fourth chapter. We also know that when the seventh seal is opened, which is the moment of the second coming, remember the seventh seal, seventh trumpet, and seventh bowl of wrath are all the second coming of Jesus. It, after that seventh seal, remember, there was that fire being stoked on the altar of the throne of God. So perhaps from John's vantage point, now as, as God is showing him the, 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 the uh, bowls of wrath, that he sees the fire reflecting from the throne, from the altar in front of the throne, off of that clear sea of glass. You see what I mean? And so it appears that it's on fire almost, but it's, it's glowing from the fire that we saw God stoking, by the way, with the prayers of all God's people, the incense around his throne. And remember, so that was the first time that just before that fire that he's stoking with the prayers of his believers, he, it gets thrown to earth to destroy the unbelievers. He's getting encouragement by the incense, by the prayers of all the believers. So not only that, but here now we see is he has the great multitude beside that. All of those that did not worship the beast, that great revival after the rapture, did not take the beast or did not worship the beast and didn't take the mark. So he's got... He's got all of his, um, his dead and raptured believers, the prayers of all of them. He's just consuming himself with that. And then he, and now we see he has a crowd of, of determined, faithful believers that, that post-rapture, so they didn't go up in the rapture, but man, they weren't going to screw up a second time. And so with all the encouragement of those who love him and choose him, even to the point of death, that's what encourages him to get the job done and to destroy all the unbelievers so that the believers can live eternally in safety. Verse 2, And standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. This is the great multitude. Revelation 7 we, we've, is the second time we actually meet the, the great multitude. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, post-rapture converts, that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white, white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? Remember, I personally think that was John talking to himself. I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. 
They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They are the last to be saved. We saw them. This is interesting. Um, yeah. We saw them first in the fifth seal, way back in the sixth chapter. And they were, it was the, the beginning remnants of the great multitude. So, so they had, the, the uh, believers who post-rapture converts were just starting to be killed. And where were they? They were under the altar. Well, once the great multitude is complete, where are they now? They've now come out from under the altar and they're now standing in front of the altar beside the great crystal sea in front of the throne. So they've graduated. They've resurrected. So this enhances the incentive for God to pour out his wrath. That, that can't be uh, overstated. His believing children are not safe as long as there are unbelieving children living, especially proven in this great tribulation. The, the, the unbelievers are killing them off. Once again, God uses his beloved believers as an incentive to do the unthinkable but just thing to destroy his beloved unbelievers. They're standing beside the sea. They were beside the sea, which also indicates that they were on land, right? If you're beside the sea, you found dry land. So this is a slap in the face to the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth, that the, the guys that are controlling the kings and nations and that Antichrist that are controlling the tribulation. And they orchestrated, those two, guys, those two beasts orchestrated the death of this great multitude. Well, here they are, like a, like a lion standing over its dead prey. And similar to the angel with the little scroll, um, the, the guy, that, the one that said there'd be no more delay, he comes out and puts one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, showing his dominance over these beasts. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's, of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. So earlier in the last chapter, 14, we saw the 144,000 been given harps, harps and were singing a song that only they could learn. Here the great multitude sings their song with their heart, with their own harps. And this song is known. In fact, it's been known for thousands of years, we're going to see, since Israel first became a nation. Right? Because it says the song of God's servant Moses. Well, that's thousands of years before this, this point. That's an old song. And here's how it goes. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. So this is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, which Moses wrote, by the way. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. So as usual, we're going to rightly divide the words. We're going to go back to Deuteronomy. We're going to go one chapter before and see what the context of him writing this is, which is translated into the song here in Revelation. So the context is this. Uh, chapter 31, Moses recited the words of the song from beginning to end in the hearing of the whole assembly of Israel. <laughs> this is... This is crazy. Moses had just finished writing the book of the law and predicted that Israel would, would in fact, be disobedient. So he says, after Moses finished writing in a book the words of, this, of the, this law from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, so the priests. Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. There it will remain as a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stiff-necked you are. If you'd been re rebellious against the Lord while I'm still alive and with you, how much more will you re rebel after I die? Assemble before me all the elders of your tribes and all your officials, so that I can speak these words in the hearing and call the heavens and the earth to testify against them. For I know that after my death you are sure to become utterly corrupt and to turn from the way I have commanded you. In days to come, disaster will fall on you because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord and arouse his anger by what your hands have made. He's pretty frustrated at this point. But if you had read <laughs> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and this is the last book of the law, Deuteronomy, 
You read those, you'll see exactly why he was so frustrated. <laughs> and he spoke, I believe, on God's behalf. So God gives Israel fair warning through Moses that they would rebel and the law was proven, was written to prove it. So this, the final seven plagues, and the full wrath of God being poured out makes it look like God is unjust, doesn't it? Unjust, unloving. But this song, originally recited by Moses thousands of years beforehand, with a fair warning that you're probably going to screw up, God is just. It, it appropriately celebrates God's deeds in the context of his wrath. They are great, they are marvelous, they are just, and they are true. He's a God of his word. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? <laughs> that's, that's like them saying, you'd be crazy not to. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. Now this comes from Jeremiah 10. So let's go to Jeremiah 10 so we can catch more context. Hear what the Lord says to you, people of Israel. This is what the Lord says. Do not learn the ways of the nations or be terrified by signs in heaven, in the heavens, though the nations are terrified by them. For the practices of the people are worthless. They cut a tree out of the forest and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with a hammer and nail so it will not totter. <laughs> like a scarecrow in a cucumber field, their, their idols can't speak. They must be carried because they can't walk. Don't fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. <laughs> no one is like you, Lord. You are great, and your name is mighty in power. Who should not fear you, King of the nations? This is your due. Among all the wise leaders of the nations and all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. Hey, don't you hear the Lord's frustration in that? Like, are you crazy? I, I made that tree. You carve this thing out and you you, you, uh, you adorn it with all this pressure. Oh, and you, you, you got to reinforce it so it doesn't teeter totter. Verse 4 concludes, all nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. And this comes from a song of David. So isn't it neat that this song comes from uh, Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, and, and a psalm. And written really... Um, if you think about it, between Moses and, and David, wow, there's a lot, of, a lot of water under the bridge there. How fitting for God to give David, the man after his own heart, the prophetic word about how faithful, about his faithfulness even in the midst of end time wrath, like did, little did David know. Among the gods there is no, none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. That comes from a man after his own heart. After God's own heart. So the great multitude sings a crucial song at a crucial time. Because it, it's hard to justify God's full wrath when we know that he's love. But God's justice is in the midst of his wrath. He's simply responding to the decisions of the people. Remember in chapter 14, twice he called it the valley of decision. The valley of decision. I'm responding. This isn't, God's saying this isn't my decision. This is, Well, this is my decision with the cause and effect of your obedience and disobedience. And that's how I started this whole revelation, chapter 2 and 3. Had my son talk to you about the cause and effect of the valley of decision, and I'm simply responding. Sin isn't, isn't God rejecting you, it's us rejecting him. So this particular warning, the Song of Moses, is currently 3,500 years old, so no one has an excuse. Revelation 1.3, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Amen.